Lewis Road started really as a, as a uh, it's just one of those chance events, sort of, because um, in any of these things, I think actually there are lots of things going on, but, but, but something just suddenly crystallizes um, things and, and, and you see them as a whole. And so in this case, um, it was a uh, trip on a uh, Sunday afternoon to, a wet Sunday afternoon actually, to uh, New World Vic Park, which is our local uh, supermarket. And I was, uh, you know, so I'm a Kiwi, I'm a uh, big fan of bread and butter. Um, and over the years I'd sort of decided that New Zealand butter didn't taste, uh, d didn't taste reliably good. It was sort of up and down and all over the shop. But, um, so I had decided that instead I would uh, shop with uh, using Lurpak, which I'd done for, for a decade or so. And so anyway, I was uh, going to the dairy aisle and I was reaching up for a pack of Lurpak and putting it on the shopping trolley. And then I had just had one of those, you know, those little moments, which is, um, what am I as a Kiwi doing, uh, putting a, uh, a pack of Danish butter in my shopping trolley? You know, when, when New Zealand should be making the best butter in the world. So that's where it, that's where it really started. Um, and so I then went uh, home and looked up uh, YouTube and um, I got this wonderful sort of hillbilly uh, woman from uh, the uh, Appalachian Mountains and she was sitting in, a, uh, in front of a, uh, on a big old lazy boy um, showing me how to make, how to make uh, butter in a jar. And the jar actually is, is up there, it's got cookies in it at the moment, but that's, uh, that's as close as we've ever got to a factory by the way. Uh, right there, um, so I made the I made the butter, and that was uh, that was good. And it sort of uh, proved that um, it's pretty easy to make um, butter. It's really hard to make great butter, but you know it, it it was enough to get me going. And then the the tipping point, if you like, and there's always sort of you know one thing that just sort of tips you over the edge. And for me, it was uh, we were going out to dinner that evening you know, with a group of friends, and and. Uh, one of these, one, one, of, one, of the, one of the guys was, uh, was, you know, was, was seriously successful and, uh, and so it was like quite an alpha sort of uh, table. So, and he was saying, so what are you up to? And so I was running through my you know, list of things I'm doing and I could just see I wasn't sort of quite making the connection I should have been making, Mike. So I said, oh, and I, by the way, I'm going to start a butter company. And he sort of, he looked at me and seriously and he said, oh, well, that's, that's really cool, but you're not doing it out of the, like, the boot of your car, are you? Which, which, which was a doubly hurtful comment because it's the same comment my brother had made uh, to me when we started Antipodes Water. He said, yeah, it's a good little business, but it's like out of the boot of the car, isn't it? So I was, I was doubly hurt by that. So I said, no, 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 it's going to be a real, it's going to be a real business. I'm really serious about it. And so that was on the Sunday evening and on the Monday I rang uh, the owner manager of uh, New World, uh, Jason Woodyhera. Um, and said, Jason, you don't know me from a bar of soap, but my wife keeps you afloat. Um, and I want to talk to you about an idea. I want to make um, uh, a butter that New Zealand can be proud of. And if I do that, will you sell it? And he said, you make it, I'll sell it. And that's really how the, how the journey started. I think we're up against not one, but two, really. So it's, um, and I hadn't realised that when we started <laughs> making butter. But... Um, uh, yeah, basically the, the, the advantage you have, the disadvantage you have is, is scale, obviously you're just not as big and not as well connected and you know, etc. and resourced, but the advantage is that you are sort of small and nimble uh, and I think that, that, that you're using sort of every little brain cell that's sort of, you know, rattling around there and just trying to keep ahead, you know, keeping ahead of the, of the competition is is absolutely critical because if you're always ahead, you can never be, you can never be beaten. You know, it's just it's it's when you allow the competition to catch up and overtake you that you're in deep trouble. So I came across a quote during a board meeting, which shows how much attention I was paying in the board meeting. But um, the quote was from Spike Milligan, and it was a um, British comedian. And the quote was. Um, we have no plan, so nothing can go wrong. I thought it was, it was perfect as we were doing a sort of a five-year you know, review thing. The focus, I think, really early on is, is not so much on a master plan, um, but on what do I need to do next to get this thing moving. You know, what, and, and my view is that early on in businesses, uh, there are just a thousand things you've got to do, and, and all thousand of them are important, and you've just got to... You, I always have this vision of spinning plates, you know, you've just got all these plates spinning 
and you've just got to pay attention to the bit that's getting a bit wobbly and get that going again and, you know, and, and be very um, flexible in terms of what you're going to focus on. So um, Lewis Road started without a, without a plan, it just started with a vision. And I think this whole vision and mission thing is you know, completely overcooked. But I do think you need to have a sense of what you want to achieve. Um, and you don't have to be particularly articulate about it and you don't have to reduce it to you know, four stunning words or whatever. You just, you just need to sort of know what you want to do and, and then pursue it relentlessly. And I think the, the people who win are the ones who spend most time trying to win. Many waking hours that I have where I'm not sort of running some scenario, you know, uh, around in terms of some issue that we're facing or some opportunity in front of us or whatever. And um, so by the time you sort of put that on paper, it's pretty well thought through. W one of the real tricks is to see ideas where others don't see them. Uh, and so I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a voracious reader of, you know, newspapers and books and magazines, you know, sort of anything basically that, that, that's got words on it. And, but I'm not a big fan of, of of sort of standard business texts by and large because they they for me at least they, they don't tend they don't tend to sort of inspire me uh, in the way that reading a great article in the New York Times does and the New York Times article could be about anything it could be the war in Syria but there's just there's something that, there's just a little spark in there that that that, that sparks another thought that leads to another you know and so I think the the, 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 the thing that um, I'd recommend everyone to do is keep, is keep mentally really active. Um, and I think that's what, um, you know, that's what such things as, as, as reading does. It just, it just keeps, you, keeps your brain on full alert. So having grown up in you know, the world of, of, of sort of mass communication, um, uh, my view now is uh, that, that that whole world is changing um, completely. And, and one of the great opportunities that um, anyone who wants to start a business has now that didn't exist even 10 years ago was the advent of social media and the ability to really communicate in a way that um, was, has never been there before and to have others communicate on your behalf. Um, you know, good, bad and indifferent. But there's an enormous amount of communication happening day in and day out. So you don't, the, 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 the necessity to create it yourself and spend major dollars on it, which is often the real stumbling block for someone just starting out, you know, that they just don't have the dollars, that's gone away. So the good news is that with social media, I think um, anyone can step up to the mark uh, and be heard. And, and I guess the bad news is, you know, and so can a person on the left of you and on the right of you. So in many ways it makes um, entry easier, um, but then it just means you've got to be even faster and smarter than uh, you've ever been before because things are moving at such an incredible pace. And someone used the analogy for me is, you know, you, you, you really, you want to think about a new product as though it's a, a, you know, a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths or whatever, you know, it's this uh, tiny little thing who, who, who could grow into something, you know, extraordinarily, um, uh, you know, you know, lovable and, and you know, into an adult that, you know, is, is everything that every parent would want. But, but, but to begin with, they, they, it's a very fragile thing and uh, you can't really expect to treat a new idea in the way that you treat an established product. You know, you, 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 you've got to show it the love, um, you know, in, in, my, in my terms. You, you've, you've got to understand that you know, it needs it needs help, and it needs to be protected, and you, and you know, you need to you need to help it grow and, and into the adult that you want it to become. Uh, and you can't expect it to be uh, an adult from day one. Which is why, by the way, I come back to business plans. You know, they often sort of make a a really poor assumption about what it takes to get to maturity. You know, every step of the way, you know, the journey the journey continues, and and you and and then you you know you you start crawling and walking and running and you, and you do it as quickly as you can but you don't get ahead of yourself. And you enjoy it, you know, you make sure you enjoy the, you enjoy the, uh, the journey. So you've got to keep an open mind and, and again with um, Lewis Ray, you know, it started as a, as a butter business uh, and now as I say butter is about 5% of what we do uh, and in a year or two 
uh, you know, our business will, will be changed again enormously by the new products that we bring on stream and the new directions we're going in. And that's just the, that's the, that's a real lesson I think, which is, you know, where, where you end up is, is definitely not where you start. So you've just got to be really open to that and, and be prepared to change direction and seize opportunities and, you know, when you hit a brick wall, you know, make a left turn and see what happens there and just keep going. Just keep going, you know, but never stop. A guy called Bill Hall um, wrote to me and said, Ding, we manufacture outdoors equipment and we think that the people that sell it have no idea what they're talking about. So why don't you run a course that teaches them what a good pack is and what a bad pack is and what a good sleeping bag is and so on. So I ran the course and at the end of it, Bill came up to me and said, Ding, I want you to come and work for me and I won't take no for an answer. If you have a business plan or a strategic plan, I always say hold it light, lightly, not tightly, right? Because if you are so hell-bent, we are going to make that soft drink by the end of the year, come hell or high water, right? Even if I'm just going to ignore the fact that nobody wants to eat sugar anymore, I'm going to do that bloody soft drink. You, you know, you're crazy. You've got to hold your business plan lightly and move with the market. It's that authentic, deep interest in your customer and does your product or service have any value and do you care about anything more than making a lot of money out of it? I always find it fascinating that people's um, actually want to win lotto and then run away. I'm thinking, or they actually are thinking, well, if you're dreaming about winning lotto, what kind of life are you living? Do you think that a whole lot of money is, it's, I find that odd. Like, oh, if I won lotto, I wouldn't be living here. I'd be, <laughs> I find that really interesting. Well, I think originally, um, my view when I came into uh, Green Acres was that um, franchising in New Zealand would, had, uh, been on a really steep growth curve um, and it was going really well but it lacked uh, structure um, and, it, and it had exactly the, it lacked the exact things we've just been talking about and that it, it had a whole bunch of people that had got on board this train that internationally was going like this but around the fringes it was getting really weak in terms of systems and support and structures and so that's what I felt I could bring to this business when I was looking to invest in this business or a business that's where I saw that I could bring uh, value to the organisation. And um, so we let the dream run, but we put some nice controls around it so that it would run in the right direction. And, and uh, that's really what I've been doing for the last uh, nearly 20 years here. There's a lot of talk about digital disruption around the world at the moment um, and innovation and transformation. I largely don't agree with that. I think that. Um, uh, digital is an evolution of business, not a disruption. I think that disruption is possibly an excuse for people that haven't done it yet. So if you kind of look at all the great ideas, do they, do they add value? Do they make our lives easier? Possibly, you know. The internet's a great idea, that definitely makes our lives easier. Paper clips used to make my life easier, but they don't anymore. But there's, you know, I think there's probably a lot in that. Because you, you, you probably need some passion for what you do, don't you? If you've got a great idea, you want to be passionate about it. Because if, if I come to you and say, Mike, help me with this idea, and you don't see passion in it, if you don't see that this man, this boy is going to take it there, are you going to back me? Entrepreneurial people come to us with ideas, and the first thing I do is I open up the app store and see how many of them are out there in the market. And sometimes you find ones that have already got 10 million users. So, you know, it's game, set, and match immediately for those guys. So. I'm probably willing to accept they're further back in their journey, um, so they may be pre-revenue. Uh, but you definitely look at the, the strength of the founders, um, and you like to see that the teams are cross-functional. Uh, you know that they've got people there covering off um, sort of strategy, business, commercialization. You know they're, they're generally they're, they're techies. You know whether they're their software dev team, a um, uh, quality, and they're joined up with the more commercial people because you see the powers and you know, how strong is their design. Um, as I've said before, do they understand their customer? Have they built a really strong product? 
are they aware of what's already out there? So you, you want to see that they're um, not knee deep in coding whilst the world is passing them by. Um, and, and a sense of speed and cadence because we, we operate in an environment now where you, your idea may only be a great idea for a matter of weeks before somebody else somewhere else in the world builds the same thing. And you know, one of the words you'll find in, in good old lean language is unfair advantage. You know, if you were a McKinsey, you'd call it competitive advantage. So w what is it that makes you think that your, your, your advantage is um, you know, differentiated from the pack and sustainable over time? So, and that could be quite simply that you scale first, um, you know, like a, a trade me did. You know, they got ahead of the pack, they built the community and, and built an un, unassailable position. So, and getting very clear about what is the problem I'm trying to solve, um, really validating that with my target market, whoever that may be. And that means, you know, um, pounding the streets, talking to people, finding out um, has the thing you've locked in on, is there really a problem to be solved or is there a need that you can meet that people are unaware of? Um, getting clear on that and then going back to, to your solution uh, and making sure, first of all, does my solution fit that problem? Uh, and then starting, starting from there and really go through the process, whether you're building a piece of software or a physical product, build that, go out and test it again, um, make sure you've got, as they say, problem solution fit. If you're at that point, then you can probably start thinking about getting on a path to building a business. Look, I think for um, people, people starting today, um, you know, the challenges about getting, getting a new business stood up, you know, getting your idea turned into a, into a product and getting it to market are a lot less than they used to be. Um, you know, of course, that depends on where you're operating. If you're op operating, for example, in the manufacturing space, um, you know, you're up against the, the manufacturing power of the likes of China. But if, you, if you're building, um, you know, tech solutions that are around software, um, I think the opportunities are actually much greater than they used to be and the barriers much less. We've got, you know, ubiquitous connectivity globally now through, um, you know, whether it's um, fixed broadband or mobile broadband, you know, the internet's pervasive. Um, it's really a catalyst for creativity and unlocking innovation. So I think um, for a lot of young people, um, the opportunity is greater than it's ever been. Um, but so are your competitors, because they're everywhere. Um, you know, it could be two guys in a garage in Bangalore now having a crack at a bank. So it's really, it's really being um, clear on, again, what problem you're trying to solve and how you plan to solve it, and then unlocking um, what they call these exponential technologies to help you do that, whether you're using you know, AR or VR, or you might be using quantum computing, or um, um, you know, um, you know, micro-manufacturing with 3D printers and the likes. It's how do you um, use those exponential technologies to really unlock your idea and get it to market quicker? Uh, the days of having to do traditional marketing um, are, are pretty numbered and your ability to create massive reach very very fast, very cheap is, is, is out there now with things like Thunderclap um, as, as one example, um, using social networks, um, thinking about your, your customers and what channels, where to meet them. So I think the, the opportunity now for, for people who want to be entrepreneurial is the highest it's ever been. I always start with a hypothesis. I, I think that marketing strategy. I think I, 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 years ago I was given a lecture by when, when, when I, years and years ago when I was a young man at university, and my marketing tutor said to me that marketing is simply your ability to put yourself in your consumer's shoes, and to have an empathetic point of view. And I absolutely, I, I know that stuck with me forever. I think that your marketing strategy starts with a hypothesis around where you believe you are bridging the value gap between the product, service, or offering that you have and what the consumer desire wants or needs. So if, if you can create what you think is the irresistible bond between consumer and, and um, product, then I think you go and uh, test your theory with people and you ask them. And I don't think you have to go out and do massive big um, research studies. You know, I think you have to go and sit in the market and watch people <laughs> and um, uh, talk to people. We're not as different as we like to think we are. You know, 15 is as good as 50 if, you, if you're asking the right questions. I don't, I'm not a big fan of market research in terms of I don't think you can structure a conversation before it's been had. I, th I think you don't know what question to ask next until you've asked the last one, because it all depends on the answers you get if you're trying to genuinely find out how you can bring some value to people's lives. So I used to talk about observation and objectivity, and, and the idea being that you would um, go and sit in the market and watch. If you want to know what people do or how they engage with the product, go and watch them. Yeah, oh, well, absolutely. I think it should be really short. Um, so the other thing I kind of like is a business plan on a page. I think if you can take an image of something and um, I, so, so I don't think business is that complicated. I think there are kind of, you know, maybe eight, ten, perhaps depending on, you know, no more than 15 drivers of what makes a, a business great.
you know, your product, your position, your place, your pricing, um, your market share, your target, your, you know, the, the financial the, the performance, whatever else those things are, are not particularly complex to define. But you should be able to map it and you should be able to get it onto one page. And it should start with the value proposition in terms of why would anybody care and what they're going to get out of it. And it should ladder its way down to the boring stuff in terms of, you know, volume targets and whatever else. So there are two things. I think you should have almost a blueprint for a business that should be able to be, um, you know, think of it as an infographic, if you like, on a page. And the other one is I think you should have the inspirational video that kind of explains it as a story. And I would look at doing that as a, um, as a short inspirational story piece that you might tell one of your mates or your mum. And I would look at doing it with some music under it and use type graphics and bring it to life in a funky kind of, think of it as a, um, as, as a music video for your brand. You know, what's the messages you need to tell and, and, and how could you bring that to life? And I think if you have those two things together, you have the great thing for showing to a mass audience and everyone can go, wow, that looks exciting. I you know, really want some of that. And I think the other thing you end up with is, um, is a useful piece of um, you know, business planning that you can put in front of people that are investors and go, this is what my business is all about. And, and this shows that I've you know, thought, of, thought of all those things together. You know? And it's the same theory if you look at zero, for example. So the idea is you look at your um, least performing, worst kind of cheapest customers that you, that you have that actually just take all your time and you design a product exactly for them with like the lowest um, level of kind of service and delivery and the lowest cost that you can and you sell it to them for just enough to make a profit. And the idea is that you get all these people in there and it becomes, it grows and grows and grows and you add more and more I suppose features as you go and at the beginning everyone's sort of sitting there and saying oh well I, you know, it doesn't have enough for what I need to do but for a few it does and then you add a few more on. oh but it does have that now so I've got a few on and you basically kind of build up over the time this massive database of new customers. So the theory is, is that you keep doing that to yourself otherwise someone else will come in and sneak away which is what Airbnb did, it's what Zero did. First thing to really understand is that there is no such thing as a new idea. So any idea you've thought of has been thought of before. Is Thought of being, has been thought of before, um, but the most important thing is your execution. So, you know, the amount of times I've started a project and I've had like 10 people go to me and go, oh, I was going to do that, and it's like, well, you didn't, so ha ha. <laughs> um, I think it's really important, number one, just do it, like find the most minimum viable product you can do and do it. Like, for, for example, I know with Airbnb, they literally started with a WordPress website. Um, I've started mine, I haven't spent hundreds of thousand dollars creating my own platform, I've leased a platform to build my software, um, my training on. I, like, If you can work out a way to do it manually for your first 100, 200 customers and like see if people actually like it and tweak it, do that first before you invest like your hundreds of thousands of dollars and get investment. I think it's either just absolute minimum viable product. The other big thing, especially in tech, get to 80% and like launch. And I've had so many people say that to me, and I was like, oh, of course I'll do that. But after having a tech company, now I really understand what they mean, because you always want to like perfect it, perfect it, perfect it, and you're never going to be finished. So you just go, like just get it out there. It's not going to be perfect, and like that's okay. Like use it as your, um, that's why they love the words like beta, or like pilot program, or like testing. Um, also as a marketer, a really good way to get something across the line with the board. You go, well, we're doing a pilot test. Um, <laughs> and if it fails, it's like, oh, well, it was our pilot test. Um, yeah, it's a good, good suit trick, that one. Breaking the rules in marketing is so important. Um, you just can't, I can't emphasize enough that when we talk about Kiwis, how we are really good at innovating, but not so much getting things to market. And you need to be able to, but as Kiwis, we're allowed to kind of break the rules. Like, we're not a hugely litigious society, thank goodness. We can jaywalk without getting put in the back of the cop car. Um, but I think we do have a tendency to think quite small. So I'm really big on going thinking big. And I'm not sure if it was filmed before. It comes to really understanding the value proposition, understanding your customer, understanding what it is that you're delivering to them that they cannot get from somewhere else understanding where you do sit relative to others, why a customer should buy your product, not, not another, uh, and then being able to create an excitement and energy around that proposition and an enthusiasm and a, um, and a, and a, um, a, a really strong articulation of why, of why this product is so, is so important to consumers. 
or to to um, whoever it is that's yeah. using it. Yeah. No two brands are for the same set of customers. So, for example, you know, Clio magazine versus Australian Women's Weekly, both women's magazines. A lot of people would think a woman's magazine is a woman's magazine, but one's targeted at 18 to 25 year olds, the other one's targeted at 40 plus, and a totally different audience. So different advertisers, different buyers, different types of stories, and so on and so forth. So what I would say to people when they're thinking about brands is, is firstly, who's your market? Who's your audience? Who's your customer? Who's the person that's gonna come in off the street and buy your product, or is gonna go online and buy your product? And what does that person look like? and what do they really need in terms of the product? And then what sort of brand position are they going to respond to? Again, maybe that's, that, that's the nature of the entrepreneur. You know, you see it and you, you feel it. You, you go, this, this, this is a good idea. And you know, it's probably a little bit easier for me now. I'm a bit older and, you know, a bit of water's run under the bridge. So you can look at something and sort of have a bit more of a gut feel around how, you know, how you think it could go and what, how the market might accept what it is, and that's whether if that's a completely new idea or whether it's looking at an existing business that you think you can you can change the, the dynamics of that business and create it turn into something completely different. Um, you know, to be fair, that is what we've done with customized deliveries. You know, from what we st what it started to where it is today is, but we never bought it to keep it to how it was. It was always the vision of where it should go, um, and that's that's been you know that was the challenge. And it's amazing through the Ice House or through Kia or all these little businesses that they've got great ideas, but they come to us and they really have got no clues on who's really going to buy it or how I'm going to sell it or why this is going to make my life so much, why they make the customer's life so much better. It's very good through their lens, but it's not quite so good through the... It's like sort of that Apple story, isn't it? You know, It's like Apple's not really a... Um, so Kevin Roberts talks about this, it's creating the, the following or creating this sort of this drive. Apple's isn't really a, a piece of kit, it's not a bunch of wires and a phone, it's not really that, it's great at that but it's not what that is. Apple's a brand that really sort of makes my life amazing and make me look cool and makes my world so much more happy and efficient. <laughs> so because yeah, they've got the customers so on side and figured out that they just happen to build the phone that kind of matches that uh, that dream. Yeah, so Kia has, um, it's globally, so it has you know, thousands of world-class New Zealanders offshore that are prepared to help. Um, the way uh, most of them either reside in Asia, Europe, or the US. Uh, US is very dominated with sort of tech, um, um, Silicon Valley type. The Europe's more about um, um, real products, and then Asia's more about sort of food and, food and beverage. The way you connect to these people is via the, the Kia website, so it's Kia, uh, Kia Connect, you just Google that, and then it basically filters it down to sort of really defining your ask, you know, what really do you want some specific help with? This is my business idea and this is the ask that I'd like to talk to, you know, the head of whatever, and then uh, they'll match you up and you make that connection for you. There was a very good, uh, good little Kia story that we helped and it sort of reiterates my relationship point. Um, a little uh, innovator entrepreneur came up with a, um, a Kevlar golf bag and he had invented, the Needham based company, invented a Kiwi uh, Kevlar golf bag that basically transformed into like a trundler and a suitcase to click in and uh, to put in there in New Zealand or had little things to click on your roof racks and it was a really cool piece of, piece of kit. But he wanted to sell it to, to the world and Taylor Made was who, who he wanted to sell it to. And he tried for a year to get into TaylorMade and, and couldn't. And he went to that Kia website and connected with Kia and we hooked him up with the head of marketing at Adidas. She's a lady in Los Angeles, they own TaylorMade. And she called back the next day and said, seen his little YouTube video, cool little invention. The head of TaylorMade thinks it's an amazing idea. Get him on the plane tonight. He's got a meeting in LA at five o'clock on Friday. And the guy got on the plane and sold his little Kevlar golf bag to the world. And those little breaks and those relationships with those people can transform often a year of, you know, bashing your head against the wall. And having that little succinct story and reaching out to people like that to, to give yourself a crack is, uh, you yeah, know, that's pretty key. So I'm Jeff Ross. Um, I'm Jussie's husband. And, um, and look, a long time ago I was in advertising 
like you Hutch and then started a vodka company with Jussie and more recently have been involved in a fragrance and skincare company Trilogy in Akoya and also Moa Beer and a few other bits and pieces on the way. Entrepreneurship is about blind, dogged determination and passion to create something and it doesn't really matter what it is. For us, it started off as four different businesses, uh, nearly five, I think. There was a, a boat building business, there was a... Dive mask. Yep, there was a sort of a haberdashery of products business, um, there was a product placement company, and there was... A bit of gorse and scrub covered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was some land development, there yeah. was a lot of enterprise. And um, as you know, Hutch, I wrote the book, uh, went back and wrote Every Bastard Says No, uh, the title of which is indicative of the, the attitudes that we faced at the time. And what I learnt in talking to a clinical psychologist and trying to get inside uh, what it was that motivated us to create this um, international superstar of a, of a vodka was that it was inside of us all along as individuals. Um, we, were do we were determined people right from the very outset um, to create something bigger than ourselves and to leave a legacy. And individually we had that, but to together we had it as well. And Je Jeff's came from being off a farm uh, where he was uh, encouraged to, uh, to harvest things and grow things and kill things and sell them. And he got positive reinforcement for that. And I came from um, a single mother whose work ethic was extraordinary. And so that my role model was um, you know, extremely hardworking and, and focused. And we got together when we were very, very young and we were utterly determined to do something significant. Yeah, not every idea is a great idea and some, some are good ideas and some are great ideas and some are, have a shorter route to success than others um, and there's no preset formula for determining which ideas are going to be the clear winners and, and which are not. Um, but it probably, it probably back to the, your first question Hutch, you know, um, what do entrepreneurs have? I guess they have belief, you know, and they they have belief that their idea will work and eventually they will. Um, some just take more time and more money than others. And I think the attitude to failure is critical. Uh, it's, it, it's in New Zealand we're really uh, not as supportive of people who have, uh, who have a, a history of failures and I think you have to accrue some failures to get better. Um, in, in the States, you know, if you've had, you know, two, three failed businesses, then they, they think that can make you better as, a, as an operator. Um, here, you're stigmatised and it's, it's difficult to carry that into your next business. Yeah, look, I had eight amazing years at Saatchi and Saatchi Wellington with some very, very clever people who I learned a huge amount of. So, uh, and, then, and then when we started 42 Below, had two business partners, Grant and Steve, came from different backgrounds to me, completely different backgrounds to us. And uh, we learned a huge amount off them. So, yeah, it's the more smart people around you, the better, and the more smart people around you who are not like you, the better. Experience uh, and then, and then post-analyzing what you've gone through um, is, is a really great teacher. That is self-critique. Yeah. yeah. What um, Grant taught me, to, uh, actually, he taught me a lot about sales and the value of sales, which we might talk about soon because it's, it's such an important skill. But after a sales call um, that we did together, he would say, righto, what did, what did we do well, what did we do wrong? You critique me, I'll critique you. And we'd do that in the car straight after a sales call, write it down, and then head to the other call. And by the end of the day, you know, we were getting better and better in our sales call and our calls and our individual performance was, was on the improve. 
I think one of the critical things here, uh, one of the key learnings is that it's great to have someone who augments your skill set, whose, whose own skills augment yours. So um, being brave enough to know, in New, in, in New Zealand again we have this sort of idea that we have to be masters of everything and you know whether it's through finance and sales and, and advertising and you know we see a lot of young businesses fail because someone who's an extremely good producer of a product thinks that they're an excellent marketer or that they have poor financial acumen where if they brought in the right kind of partner uh, and collaborated well they might have had uh, a faster path to success. A lot of people think marketing is kind of an ad or um, packaging but marketing is is the, the smartest marketing actually happens you know when a product or service is created you know creating something that's incredibly different uh, and then that creates word of mouth and then that's more powerful than any advertising or, or you know any other media so yeah marketing should be at the front of the process and you know I guess that you know when we thought of um, 42 Below I guess it was marketing led thought it was like people are drinking more vodka people think New Zealand's pure um, people think New Zealand's like uh, some kind of Swedish country in the South Pacific, therefore we should be able to make vodka. So it was a simple marketing thought really which created it. And the idea of telling a story. So we were on the 42nd parallel uh, down in Wellington when we founded it in the garage and so from the front, it, it, you know, you do actually practice what you preach, Jeff, because uh, it, <laughs> because it was called 42 Below uh, for that reason and that gave us the story uh, which then, you know, years later, some of our great salespeople took out into the world. So suddenly, um, you know, bars, hot bars in Singapore and New York and London were hearing about uh, this uh, vodka that was brewed on the 40... Uh, wasn't brewed. Distilled. We brew now. Yeah, yeah. We distilled then yeah. uh, on the 42nd parallel and uh, with be beautiful, pure air quality and what else was good about it? The distilled water. 42% alcohol, a right. lot stronger. So yeah. we're creating a story even as yeah. we were um, distilling it in our garage at home. And if, like if you, you go into China, don't go to China, go to a kind of a district within a city, you know, you need to focus right in. Uh, and find like-minded like -minded people really, the personality have a good sense for the personality of the brand and the personality of the, the market and make sure there's a good match. And, and, and to Jussie's point earlier, you know, often our distribution strategy offshore was actually driven by people coming to us. You know, we would get calls from a couple of young guys in Mexico saying, we like your brand and we, we're, you know, we're keen to have it here. So you have to vet, vet some of those or you end up kind of you know, getting chased with machine we guns. Had like, yeah. We had like the rogue division and uh, Grant, who became um, Jeff's business partner, uh, said that the rogue division had to wash its own face, which meant that it had to sell uh, and get the cash in before it could actually go and visit the market. And there was all sorts of crazy stories that came out of those guys yeah, and the things that they Russia, got up to. Yeah. Russia, all sorts of dodgy deals and, and crazy things, which I wrote about in a chapter in the book. Yeah, so someone described it, you know, as kind of uh, like one of those dogs that kind of goes to the beach and chases a bird, then chases another bird, then chases another bird, and never actually gets any birds. Um, so you do, with your export strategy, need to figure out what is the one bird you're going to chase and, and grab. Um, and then I think you've got to be there. I yeah, mean, that, then, that, yeah, that was the critical there. part for us. I mean, we uprooted ourselves, a cousin, uh, two very small children, and took two staff... Um, or a part of our team uh, to a tiny midtown apartment where we really uh, worked the streets, yeah. Yeah, streets during yeah. the day and the uh, phones back to New Zealand at night. And it was absolutely critical that we were there because although we were only there in, in New York in the end just for three months, the knowledge that you took home was material to how we then treated uh, that market and, and also to LA. It was, it was critical to get there and get an understanding of what ideas would work. We were freaking out a lot of the time. You know, there were times when we couldn't get 20 bucks out of the FPOS machine and we were we were anxious yeah. and putting out fires. You know, when you when you stick your head up and you go out on a limb with anything, you are going to have moments where 
you're questioning yourself. That's why I think it was really good to be a team. You know, um, when Jeff was wobbly, you know, I'd be like, well, this has to work, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, no, I wish there's no secret for which rocks to, you know, I think you get so immersed in your brand and you lie awake all night thinking about it that you, you kind of, you know, you know, intuitively where the biggest opportunities are. Do you know one of the most important things uh, that, that played well for us when we were traveling, and, and this is from London to New York, Australia, which was a great kind market to us, uh, is that the old fashioned values count. You know, manners, do what you say you're gonna do when you say you're gonna do it. This, this stuff is just so very, very important. And I think um, Jeff, just by his nature, is uh, able to win friends and influence people because it's obvious he's a great guy and he has personal integrity. And you know, people have a bullshit radar and in business, eventually those people who aren't going to operate with, um, with good integrity get found out. We, we are uh, capable of um, incredibly hard work and we can adapt and you know we, we were at the Venice Biennale one year, we threw a big party there and of course uh, all the other parties got shut down in Venice at midnight wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. But our cool person, Ange Barnett actually, who uh, she staked out a, uh, a fabulous premise just on the outskirts of where that, uh, that curfew was so that the New Zealand party, our 42 Below party could go after the deadline and those stories travel and if you know even in those days where there wasn't Instagram and Facebook um, you know stories travel uh, well because we felt we'd learned so much it's felt like it'd be a shame not to just to park all those learnings and you kind of naively uh, kind of thought that goodness you learned so much the second time around it's going to be so much easier um, but of course there's a whole new set of challenges so a friend had started a uh, a fragrance company in Akoya and I quite like that it was one of the senses like taste like vodka and we could see a general move or we felt there's a general move to surrounding yourselves with a richer sensory life so fragrance in your home seemed to be a growth market and you know our investigations into it seemed to seem to believe so and it had a natural story you know no paraffin in the wax we like that so we invested in that got involved and then quite quickly um, we got approached by Trilogy, a New Zealand skincare company, also a natural skincare company. We've always been pretty um, big believers in the natural sector of the market being a growth market, and particularly when it comes from New Zealand, um, we think that's a strength. So we got involved in Trilogy and Acquire as well, uh, with Grant and Steve. Uh, and Grant and Steve is, and myself are still involved in that business. So the summary there is, I think, what Jeff looked for, and it was certainly with craft beer as well, was is it scalable? Um, is yeah. the category in growth? Yeah. And can um, our, your skill set have a material difference to this brand? So those, is that, do you think yeah. that's correct? Those yeah. three Yeah, Th those filters? were the things. Yeah. And does it have a margin? Uh, is brand, you know, we kind of into brand, so is brand a going to play a role in building this business? And yeah, and our trilogy now is a huge business. It's the biggest business we've ever been involved in, you know, it's, and um, gl globally, and you know, its, it's sales will be over a million, uh, over a hundred million, you know, so that's, that's getting a bit of, bit of scale to it now.